was thinking of, uh, <clears throat> as we come to a, a new year, and I said, well, I'll just, uh, I will hold off on going back to Exodus for uh, until the beginning of next year. And uh, just a, a challenge, a word, as we think about coming to a new year. Uh, the December 21st, in my calendar, well, you know about that, right? That just, that went and gone, you know, and... Uh, we realize that the Holy Word of God has it all laid out before us, and uh, we should not lose heart or feel uh, or fall prey to such foolishness. But I think there's an opportunity to uh, be wise in, in presenting to people that the world is going to end. Jesus, the Lord Jesus, is coming back again, and He is going to come not as a suffering servant, but as a concrete King. And I, I don't think, uh, maybe we don't even comprehend that. But he is coming back as the concrete king. Even so, Lord Jesus come. So if you would, James chapter 5, verse 13 and 14. It says, Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And, and I was first caught with this, these verses. The idea is, uh, is any among you uh, that are afflicted, is any married, uh, uh, let him sing song. Is any sick? And I'm just thinking of, of uh, we could say, let's fill in the blank. Is any here this morning? Uh, fill it in. Here it says, you know, if you're afflicted, if you're married, or if you're, you're sick physically, he says, uh, but, but think about this for a minute. It takes all kinds of people in, in divers or various kinds of trials and many different levels of spirituality to make up a local church. Think of that. It would be pretty horrible if everybody was just like me. Don't you think? You can shake your head. <laughs> <laughs> I, look, I look myself in the mirror sometimes, uh, a lot of times in the Word, find out there's a whole lot of work left to be done. But see, that's the gloriousness of God, right? I mean, one kind of flower. You know, it would be pretty boring if there was only one type of snowflake, right? But see, we have to get this idea that it takes many kinds of people divers, various kinds of trials, and many different levels of spirituality to make up a local church. And uh, I think of anything that's important, that should be important in your life, is the local church. Because Christ gave his life for the church, for the body. You see, some people say, I love the Lord Jesus, I love God, but I can't stand God's people. I don't want to be in his house. I don't want to be fellowship. I don't want to worship him. You know what? I have a question about them even knowing God. Because John does tell us, if you say you love God and you don't love God's people, well, because you don't know God. But you see, how should it be? Well, I want you to turn real quickly, and we'll go back to James, to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 23. The Apostle Paul, in his analogy of the body, does quite well. It's, it's amazing. Uh, Set of verses, but 1 Corinthians 12, verse 23, we'll begin there in the middle of the chapter, and we'll read down to verse 26. But notice how the Apostle Paul puts it, and I believe this is, this is the case about the body, okay? And those members of the body, which we, take, we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor, and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness, for our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which is lacking. Now, just think from it, you know. Sometimes we think of, uh, we say, well, if I was not in the local body, if I wasn't in this church, nobody would miss me. No, not so. Because the other parts of the body, okay, they see this uncomely, as it were, you know, weep brother or sister and what do we do? We, we rally around them. We say you are God has placed you here 
And I think that's what Paul is saying here too. But notice here in verse 25, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. And I, I think verse 26 sums it up. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. I think this is how the body should be. And so this morning I would ask, going back to James <coughs> chapter 5, James says, any sick among you? Now, first of all, yes, he's talking about physical healings there, verse 14 and 15, about anointing of oil and all that, and I'm not really getting into that. But there are some here that are physically sick, right? We're praying. You know, I'm just, uh, just waiting for the news from Brother Angus to see what God would do. See, there are some that are sick, okay? And the solution is there, verse 14, Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Now, sir, sure, I'm going to say that all, and I believe it's true, that not all sickness is because of sin, right? In life, that's not true. Not, not all sickness is because of sin. We're talking about uh, sickness, there's trials, there's tex, uh, uh, tribulation, affliction, okay? God gives you a thorn in the flesh. God gives you cancer. God gives you this or that because He knows best and He's going to try you. And you're going to come and shine forth as gold. So it's not always if you're sick that it's because of sin. But dear ones, listen, it can be a factor in your sickness, right? Verse 15. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. But there are other types of sicknesses, don't we have? We could think of emotional sickness. Now, we're not talking about mental illness and all that. We're just saying uh, the idea of, uh, of uh, you know, sadness, grief, okay? What happens? The body uh, gets together, we, we rally each other, uh, God gives us grace and strength, uh, the scriptures are there for support, you know, we're praying for one another, as it says there, but there's also, we think of mental stress, that, you know, uh, you know, the job can be too much, you know, and other things, you know, I think it was Kathy and Sarah were talking about uh, vacation time for me, you know, I said, what are you try, guys trying to do, you know, but it wasn't that, it was just, I thought of Brother MacArthur, John MacArthur, he says, he said, John, and he's doing a thousand times more than I'm doing, okay? For sure, okay? And Brother John MacArthur says, uh, when are you gonna they ask him, when are you going to retire or take some time off? He says, when I get to heaven. This is, this is the daytime. Work while it's day, for the night cometh, but no man work. Okay? Now, I'm not talking about foolish, you know, you know we understand, but you see, there could be mental stress, um, you know, for a pastor, uh, if I didn't have the avenue of prayer, man, I'd be sunk a long time ago. If I didn't have the avenue of uh, brothers and sisters being encouraging to me, not only giving me a word, but also doing right, that's an encouragement. Okay? But there are also, we think of this sickness of, there's relational. Notice it says, if I, I didn't make, I mean, I didn't, I'll, I'll just mention it offhand. We'll go back to 1 Corinthians. Uh, chapter 12 says that there be no schism, division. You see, there, there's this relational uh, aspect of the church of God, the family of God, the body of God. You see, if there's a cancer in my body, you see, all the cells, all the organs, everything's going to work towards getting rid of that cancer. Everybody's going to work together. It's relational. Sometimes there's a relational sickness, I call it, in the sense that there are schisms, divisions. We're not acting like God's children, in God's family, in God's house. Okay? Consider, if you would, that how um, we could not live without each other, could we? This relationship kind of thing. You see, in the Old Testament, it was the it was the temple, was the center of Jewish life. It was. And, and the church house, or the family of God. Now, God gets rid of the building, you know, takes the building, He gives it to us, He takes it away, you know. We'll still, it'll still be Calvary Baptist Church meeting. 
Simply a, a believer's meeting, the remnant meeting, whether it's in this house or that house, we'll still have that relationship, right? So, you know, we think about this relationship that we have, you see, and it's so fundamental, you know, it's God's way for society. We, we have to learn to live, live with each other, right? Okay? Uh, we think of uh, the relationship there in our families. In our families, our blood families. Uh, you know, I think of, uh, I've been neglected in that. You know, see, some of my children have never seen their uncles. Some of my children have never seen their uncles. They don't even know that they have uncles. And I'm sitting there kicking myself. What am I doing? That's not right. See, but there's also, there's a church relation. And in a sense, as we function, to grow, to be a healthy, God-honoring in every way. And so, first things first. See, you can't have uh, other relationships, like the horizontal, to flourish unless you have the vertical in place. So I would ask you, first of all, this morning, whether you are a young person, an old person, or in between, do you have that relationship with God through the Lord Jesus Christ, through the shed blood and by faith alone? Do you have that relationship? Because if you're trying to work out the horizontal without the vertical, dear ones, you're, you're barking up the wrong tree. You'll never make it. It won't be for God's glory. I mean, that's what the UN is trying to do, right? That's the, the you know the uh, you know you know man's attempt to uh, you know live in peaceful existence. Just rub out Israel, then everybody will live in peaceful existence. That's not the way it is, okay? So we have to have the vertical and for the horizontal. If the uh, vertical is missing, then dear ones, you know, uh, it, we're, we will be dysfunctional. It's not going to happen, okay? So we need a relationship with the Lord God, through the Lord Jesus Christ, through His shed blood, by grace, through faith alone. Do you have that this morning? Do you have that this morning? If you do, you have something to build on. You see, you have something to build on. Now, as I think about it, a New Year's message, coming year, 20... 13. Something new. I'm going to have to face a fine. I'm going to have to go to court. I said, that's interesting. I said, Lord, how much... Um, it says, through much tribulation, you must enter into the kingdom of God. I said, Lord, is it just beginning? Well, is, is it just starting? How much more? Okay? But you see, as I think about this new year, what do I want for the new year? Now, I don't know why I don't like resolutions. You know, usually if you go to Philippians chapter 2, I think it's, or 4, 2, 3, 4, it says, you know, uh, leaving those things behind, you know, looking forward, pressing towards the mark, the high price, the high calling of God, okay? That's good. And I believe that's, that's what I, the first one, I want a closer walk with God, don't you? I want a closer walk with God. Number two, and this is really what I want to speak about this morning, I want more profitable walk and fellowship with, for example, and I can say this for all of us, you know, for, for if you have a spouse, okay, uh, we want a more profitable walk and fellowship with our children. We want a more profitable uh, fellowship with, with our church family. You see, and then, you know, see, some th items on my heart, see, our relationships need to be healed in order for them to grow biblically. Our relationships have to be healed, but they have to be healthy. That's the first thing. The second thing I would like in this year, I could point it from my own uh, heart, first of all, I want less hypocrisy in my life. I want less hypocrisy and less hypocrisy in your life. The third thing I was thinking about, and I really, I think all of us are praying for this, that we would see souls to be saved. See, I'm not asking for one or two, I'm asking for a harvest. I'm asking for the gathering. You see, I've been in church. I was not in churches. I've been, you know, the afterglow. You know what the name of the afterglow? You go to Peachtree, Mount Pisgah Church, and you can sit down with Brother Troy Foster, and he'll tell you about what happened on the hill in 1986 when God came down. And most of the deacons were saved. Men that are down deacons, that are still 
Uh, Pastor David. I mean, and you just listen to this. Oh, come on, just, wow, that's glorious. They're still seeking that. God will again. Then you go to uh, Community Baptist, Elmendorf, Texas. And when we got there, Satan had almost destroyed that church by an elder. Another elder came in. An elder came in to steal the sheep and destroy the pastor and destroy the church and have it all for himself. And he almost did it. And the church was really reeling and, you know, hurting. But see, that church also had a time of refreshment. There wasn't just one or two brought in. There was a gathering. There was a, a souls, many coming in, okay? And the church is like an emphasis. It's like an emphasis, I mean, where God just pushes us off. Dear ones, that's what we need. You keep praying. And so, those are the three things I think of. Our relationships to be healed in order for them to grow biblically. Number two, less hypocrisy in my life, in yours. And third, for souls to be saved. And that all for the glory of God, the glory of the Lord Jesus. Let's just touch on the first one. Meaning, uh, this idea of relationships, okay? The healing of our relationships, so they might grow biblically. The repairing of our relationship. This, this relational chip, this relationship that we have one to another, as we call each other brother and sister in the Lord. I think of that sometimes in the, in the North, that, that's lacking. You know, in the South, you call them brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so. I, I love that. You see... When I came up here, I mean, I've neglected my family in, in, in Ohio and stuff like that, my brothers. We see, the Lord says, Tom, when you're going to go up to Canada, you're going to burn the bridges. You, you, you know, I have no family to go to, basically, on Christmas or New Year's. I don't. I mean, I could go down, we, I could go down and fill you know. But there, there's nothing in common at all that we have. But you see... But I have a relationship here with brothers and sisters that I highly prize and, and love. You see? And I want to uh, enhance and, and let that relationship grow. And I'm hoping that I'll work with my brothers too. But your brothers and sisters in the world, you come first. Think of that. You come first. The healing of our relationships. Two instructions there, if you're there in James chapter 5, verse 16. Um, two instructions. Confess your faults one to another. That's number one. Number two, pray one for another. We'll look at that another time. And, and finally, the result, that you may be healed. We'll, we'll look at that as a conclusion. But let's look, look at number one. Confess your faults one to another. Confess your faults one to another. Now, what, what, what I mean, this is, this is going to, what, repair, bring healthy relationships, right? Now, think of this. The first thing we have to do is confess our faults one to another. When you confess your fault, you are acknowledging that one's relationship is wrong. Is that true? That one's relationship is damaged. That one's relationship is in need of repair. That's whether husbands and wives, or parents and children, or children and parents, or, you know, church and pastor, elder, deacon, you can go, you know. Listen, confess your faults one to another. When you confess your faults, you are acknowledging that, one, that one's relationship is wrong, is damaged, is in need of repair. Now, I think it's, it's good to say that if you confess your faults one to another, you're realizing that that relationship is, is important, isn't it? You see, we, we often say, time will heal. Time doesn't heal anything. It doesn't. You see, if, if I just leave it alone. Now, I, I leave it alone at times when I need to pray. When I need wisdom, how to handle the situation. How do I... But see, I know that I can't leave a damaged relationship in a brother or sister or not. Because, you know, first of all, yeah, living it alone will get worse, but you see how hard it is just to maintain good relationships, right? 
Is it pretty hard? Just to maintain a good relationship with a brother or sister in the Lord, husband and wife in the Lord, children, it, it's pretty hard. We need grace. So, first of all, let's do some clarification on this idea of confess. Uh, it comes from two Greek words. Um, EX, first of all, is, it means from my heart to your heart. Okay? Out of, from. And then it has this other Greek word, homo lago, mean homo homogenized, you know, meaning that the milk is, is completely, completely, you know, fat and all that, you know, there's no separation, okay? And then uh, logos, of course, means the word, okay? And so what does it mean? You see, we're talking about uh, confessing from the heart, okay? Uh, the same thing, you know, confessing uh, reality, truth, okay? Of uh, matter of uh, where am I at? This, you know, this is serious. This is damaged. I, I need this repair. You see, you're not talking to me, or you're, you know, you're sitting on the other side of the church. It's not good. You're, you rolling on over on the other side of the bed, and, and I won't talk to you, and I won't forgive you, and I won't speak to you. It's not good. You can't let a night go by. You see, that's where it says, from the heart to the heart. Okay? Homo logos. I, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking, uh, speaking what's coming out of the heart. I'm, I'm to confess my faults. I'm still on confessing here. To the one that I have offended. To the one that I have offended. To the one I am trying to restore. And also to the one who is trying to help me. Now think of that again. Well, I confess it to God. That's the first thing. We'll see that in a minute, okay? You have to confess your faults to God, right? Isn't it so wonderful? He says, if I confess my sin, he is faithful and just to forgive me of my sins and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. God the Father said he would do that. But see, when I'm confessing my faults one to another, you see, I have to confess them to the one I have offended. I have to confess them to the one I'm trying to restore. I have to confess them to the one who's trying to help me. Now, what's the difference between confessing and complaining? You see, we're, when we confess uh, to the one who's trying to help me, am I confessing my faults or am I just complaining about the other person? That's the destructive. A good counselor would say, shut up. <laughs> You're not going to gospel, gossip. gossip. You're gonna, not going to backbite. We're not here to the murder your husband or murder your spouse or your wife or your children. No, no. no. See, a, good, a Christian counselor would say, no, we're not going to go there. Stop. Okay? This is not productive. It is not God. God only. God glorifying and honor, and you're not really loving your husband, or you're not loving your wife, you're not loving your children by what you're saying, you see. So, but notice here, this idea of confessing the faults one to another. Now, again, we've confessed our faults to God, okay? We're not Roman Catholics, we're not, we don't go to the priest, we don't go to the confessional, we don't do any of that. We, you know, it's, it's so, think of this for a minute. As a believer priest, we can do business with our Heavenly Father alone. We just go into His presence. Now, I mean, when I say alone, you know, our advocate is always there, right? The Lord Jesus. You're never going to get in God's presence without your advocate. And you're never going to get in God's presence without the mediator, our high priest, the Lord Jesus. But it's just you and God and the Lord Jesus. And you confess your sins, your faults. You seek repentance. You seek uh, to, to turn from these things. So, again, I'm not, I'm not promoting, and this is what the Roman Catholic Church does. They use this verse in verse uh, uh, 16, confess your faults one to another as a springboard to, for confessionals, articulate confession, all that. It's damnable. It's a lie. No one said that we're to confess our sins to a priest. We're to confess our sins to our Heavenly Father. Okay? But it does say, confess your faults one to another. And this is this idea of relationship, okay? And when, when we do confess our sins to our Father, 
And, uh, and we are forgiven. Now it's time for damage control. Damage control. Because none of us sin to ourselves, do we? None of us. See, our sin affects, my sin affects my wife, my children, my church, my community. I mean, there's, there's ripple effects. And after a while, you see the damage. And then you start getting into the damage truck control mode, okay? <coughs> but there has to be real, true, heartfelt, life-changing repentance, doesn't there? When you confess it to God, then repentance, and then there's reconciliation, and then there's restoration, and then there's recovery. Restored relationships. You know, I've had, uh, how many good, you know, I think, who was it? It was, uh, it was Abby, not Abby, it was Elizabeth, asked me. She, she said, uh, what's, what's the longest uh, friendship you've had as a Christian, somebody? And I had to think back from it. And you see, we have to restore the relationship. If we really confess our sins before God, then we have to start damage control, and then we have to start confessing our sins one to another. Okay? In order for me to confess my faults to one to another, I must humble myself. I must humble myself. See, I have to let go of my rights. You see, I, I, I was wrong. So I get rights. No, it's Kathy's fault. You know, she, she started the argument. Or this or that. But you see, the first thing, uh, and I believe husbands, young men, listen. The majority of the time, you have to take the initiative to start restoring this, this relationship. You have to. You're the head of the house. You're the head of the woman. It's your responsibility. Well, 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 she, 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 no. No. And the first thing that I find that I have to do is find where I was at fault, where I exaggerated, or not exaggerated, where I escalated it, okay? I didn't shut it down. I, you know, I, I, she said this, and I said that, and then she said this, and then I said that, and then, we're, you know, we're not talking. And then I have to realize, well, I've got to get back to talking. So in Matthew chapter 5, verse 23, here, here's the precedent. You see, in order for me to confess my faults to one another, the Lord says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 23, he says, Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there remembrance that thy brother hath ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go the way thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Now think of this. What is the Lord Jesus saying here? He's saying, if you have a broken relationship with a brother or sister in the Lord, then you ought not to be in church. Until you fix it. Is that true? What do you think? Now you can say, well, I'm working on it. Well, that's good. Keep on it. Okay. But he's saying it, you know, it's so important that, you know, if, it, it, well, uh, this brother, okay, the idea of reconciliation, the term there in, in the Greek and all that stuff is like, you see, the, the one that's going to, the, the, the one that's offended, you know, you, you may have not have done anything. Your conscience may be clear, but you know, so brother and so and so is not talking to me today. Now I was always, I you know, think about this. I always, you know, people don't, the brothers don't come to church, you know, for some reason, and and I said, oh, the pastor has to call them. Mm, I hate that. I do, in one way, because I, you know, am I, you know, pastor checking up on us again? Or maybe I want to convey to them that, well, are you sick or something? Can I pray for you? You see, or, or, or is there an offense? Has I, have I done something wrong? Can you tell me? Can you talk to me? See, that's, that's what the Lord is saying. I have, to, I have to go and say, well, why, why, you, why did you miss church? Or why don't, aren't you talking to me anymore? Why aren't you fellowshipping with me anymore? Well, what's this wrong with the relationship? Is it broken? You see, we can't wait for Christians to 
find out as they, you know, if, if they stop coming to church, they have stopped coming to church months, years ago, in heart. Is that true? They've sat there for, for weeks and months and years. We can't have that. We've had that happen, right? We've had that happen. But I can't say it was, you know, in the sense of all our fault, but in the sense that, you know, I'm not just trying to put blame, but you know, that, but the, the, the thing that could have helped all of us was communication. Okay? Well, so, so, you know, we need, we need to talk, okay? So, in order for me to confess my fault, I must humble myself and I must go to that brother or sister in the Lord, okay? Also, one last time, how many times do I have to confess? I'm still on confess your faults. Confess. And we'll get to the idea of faults in a minute. Um, you know the situation in Matthew chapter 18. Turn there. Again, I just want to refresh you. You probably know these verses. But knowing them is one thing, but practicing them is another, isn't it? Knowing them is one thing, but practicing them is another. Matthew chapter 18, verse 21 and 22, and verse 35, but we'll begin in verse 21. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Till seven times, Jesus said unto him, I say not unto thee, until seven times, but until seven times seventy. He says continually. It is not, you know, well, I forgave him five times, six times, ten times, twelve times. No, no. The idea of the Lord is getting, is it, you, you keep on forgiving. Okay? Now, we have to talk about, you know, there's an element of repentance there. You know, are they really repenting? All of these, these, we've studied that before. But the idea is, is how many times do I come to confess? You know, I, I come to my brother. Here comes so-and-so again. Well, brother, I've sinned here. I've, I did this again. Lord, you know, I'm praying for grace. You know, I want this relationship to be restored. Then in 35, verse 35, our Lord says, So likewise shall my Heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespass. And that, remember, that's the, uh, I'm a just steward, you know, and he was forgiven uh, a lot, and then he went over to the, his other servant, and who was forgiven a little, you know, and, and you know, so, you know, that understanding. He, he wouldn't forgive his other, his, his, his other servant. And so the Lord says, no, no, he applies it that for us. You see, love will cover a multitude of sins, but love will also remove, restore, heal a broken, damaged relationship every time. Think of that. If you can live with that, this or, or any relationship severed, then those, then, then, there, there, then there's something wrong with our Christianity. Let me repeat that. Love will cover a multitude of sins, but love will also remove, restore, heal a broken, damaged relationship every time. I mean, we'll, we'll get to the punchline, Lord willing, in <laughs> uh, the climax in a sense. Uh, how was your relationship with God? How damaged was it? Did the Lord Jesus just say, oh, well, I'll, I'll try a little bit? No, he said, I'll go to the cross. He says, by his stripes we are healed. By his stripes we are healed. You know, by God's grace. And, and by God's grace, we, can, we start to learn to be less selfish. It's going to take the rest of our life, right? For God to beat out that selfishness. But you see, there's the key. We have to be less selfish. Love will cover a multitude of sins, but love will also remove, restore, heal a broken, damaged relationship every time. If you can live with this or any relationship severed, then there's something wrong with your Christianity. And I was thinking about myself. And I got down here, you should talk, Pastor. So how many, you know... Uh, how many people have we disciplined from this church? You know, you're like, I pull out, you know, you pull out your gun, you have old notches, you know, this is how many people I've killed. Is that how it is? I hope not. By the way, for me, you know, uh, 
There are people that, that have left the church that sort of surprised that we're praying for them. I said, brother, I've been praying for you the day you left the door. The, the day you uh, put your resignation from our membership. I, I, I've been praying all before that, too. You see? But you see, there, it's, it's, it's hard, okay? But you see, uh, God draws the line for us. He says, if, if a brother will not repent, and, and we've done all we can, you know, and, and, and we could do a lot more if we could. But it just comes to a point where we have to say, okay, I draw the line. We draw the line as a church. You know, we're not going to fellowship with you. We're going to discipline you. We're going to remove you from the membership. And uh, it's not that I want to live that way. But I, I'd like to see them restored. And we should work to that end. Let's go quickly to the next one here. What am I to confess? Again, we're talking about healing relationships. And James says, confess your faults one to another, pray one for another, that you may be healed. And the first thing I believe that we need to confess our faults one to another. Um, this idea of what we need to confess. Now notice it says here, it doesn't say confess their faults one to another. Do you notice that? It says, confess your faults. Now, it's so easy. Again, you know, uh, this gossip, uh, slander, malicious words, character assassination, it's murder. It's murder. And so we have to be very careful. It, it, see, uh, when we talk about uh, I need more of the details so I can pray aright. Yeah, maybe. But well, maybe that's not really the case. You know, we've, we've, uh, you know, we've heard people praying sometimes. And, uh, you know, like Dr. Finnegan recently said in his, his letter, Lord, it's, it's me, oh Lord, who, who, who's in need of prayer. I, I'm the one who needs prayer. So we have to be very careful. See, if, if I'm going to get more details, what do, what do I get the details for? The gossip? To slander, to look down. Oh, I've never done that. No, no. We get more details so we can help solve the problem. And we can restore the relationship. That's why we would want more details, if anything, right? Because it's not, it's not just, uh, we'll find out that it's not just pastor. You see, Paul said this body, okay, in, in chapter 12, 1 Corinthians. Every, every member is particular. God has put you there for a reason. You see, I can't function without you. And you can't function without me. And so if there's a relational problem, then we have to work on removing that problem for the glory and honor of the Lord Jesus and for the good of both of us, right? So if I need more details, I, it's, so I solve the relationships of others. And uh, sometimes Kathy, you know, she talks to me about some things and, and I said, I'm so glad I don't have to talk to you about what everybody tells me. I think of that for me. And I'm not, I'm not griping, complaining at all. Okay, that's not the point. But if, if you, if a brother says this, loves, unloves, and says this, and the sister says this, and they call me up and says this, and this person says this, and, and that, that, you know who I say? I go right to the Lord. I say, so and so, what about this? What do we do? How do we pray? What are we supposed to do, Lord? You see? And, and it's, 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 it's so good, you see, because that's uh, uh, what I'm here for, but you see, that's what we, you know, this idea of, uh, Pray for one for another. I think we do pray for one another. I think that's how we got this far, by God's grace, and we're praying for each other, okay? But see, there's also this idea that we need to confess our faults one to another, okay? And then as we think about our faults, okay, we have to do something about it. Each one of us, not just pastors. So we have to check out our relationships with husbands and wives and children. It is, you know, 
I mean, that's what communion is about in a way, right? Lord's table? You can't take the Lord's table if I'm not... I can't take the Lord's table if I'm not right with a brother or sister in the Lord. I can't take the Lord's table with, you know, if, with, with, if I'm at odd with Kathy, my wife. I can't. The meaning of faults here, let's go quickly, we'll be done. Um, it's translated nine times trans, uh, trespass, it's translated offense seven times, it's translated sin three times, it's translated fall two, and faults twice. Strong defines this word fault as a slip, a lapse, <laughs> derivation. And so there's two ideas. First of all, there's unintentional, it's called an error. For example, Galatians 6 1. Galatians 6 1 is, is so good. Notice here, it doesn't say pastor or elder or deacon. It says, Brother, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, that's all of us. Okay? Restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. So this is not just that, it's for all of us. He says, brother, if a man be overtaken in a fault, it's unintentional, it, you know, maybe I, I told you so, <laughs> but, you know, it's not intentionally, you say, you go that way, you're going to get burned, this is not a good uh, decision, this is not a good path, you know, please don't do this, here's the scripture, you know, and they slip and they fall. Not being cautious or whatever. But then the other one is, is, is a willful transgression. A willful transgression. And that includes this word, a willful transgression and uh, rebellion in a sense. Um, these are strong words. For example, um, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 14, well, no, these are strong words. Let me say it this way. Uh, other places in the scripture, this word uh, fault is, is fall away. Fall away. Uh, Elijah was doing uh, Pilgrim's Progress this morning and the man in the cage. That, that's a hard doctrine. You have to go to Hebrews 6, Hebrews 7, 11 or so, or 10, and talk about how they, they crucified the Lord Jesus openly, put him to shame. But see, the Hebrew writer speaks about those that fall away, those that apostatize. And, it's very, and I think it's a very special case there. These were Hebrew, uh, uh, the, the, the Hebrews, Jews, that, that heard the gospel. Um, they, the, the, uh, were trusting the Lord Jesus, or they were uh, becoming part of the church, and then and they eventually they fell away. They went back to Judaism. Okay, they apostatized. It's not because they were saved; it's because they were never saved. But see, that's how serious it is. This idea of faults. Okay, it could be very serious. It could be unintentional. It could be willful. Okay, um, but notice this here. It says, "My faults. Confess your faults. My faults." I don't know how many of you ever thought of this, you know, and you probably, well, I don't want to parade my dirty laundry of sin before everybody. I mean, if I have to go before, you know, especially if I have to go, you know, go for, to the sister or this brother and I can confess my fault, then they're going to know about how wicked I am. Yeah, that's right. They're going to pray for you better. And then they're going to have compassion on you. And love you. Is, it, is that our mindset? No, that, that, that sister just to be on the phone, you know, on Facebook and, and Internet and Twitter and Twitter, whatever, and all that stuff, junk it. You know, it'll be, it'll be, everybody will know. Is that what you think? I know you don't think that. But often that is a case in churches. You're right. Listen, there's a gospel line, it's called the Great Line, and it's, it, it kills, it destroys it destroys. But you see, but it's not before everyone. Let's, it's warned. Warned meaning in sense if, you know, I believe that you can you confess, repent of your sin as far as it's been brought out in public. If it's a public sin, for example, if I, you know, if I, God forbid that I'm found being committing adultery, you should I would say, run me out of town, but you should strip me of my ordination. And then if I won't repent, you should kick me out. 
as far as you can if I won't repent. You see, I know brethren that have good pastors, good brothers that have fallen into that sin and they're no longer pastors, but they're still brethren. He's repented. He's still part of the church. He, he, he's lost that holy office, that, that privilege of being a pastor. You see, it's not that we're confessing, and so we confess it as far as we... Could you imagine being in the Corinthian church? In 1 Corinthians chapter 6? What did they do with issues? You know, they, they went downtown. And they went to the lawyer. And they went to the court. And that's where they, they uh, settled their issues. And Paul, the apostle, under the inspiration of scripture, said, don't you know you're going to judge the angels? You're going to judge the world? And you can't... Pick? And the interesting he said, can't you just suffer the wrong Christian? That's what he said to the two that are fighting, in a sense. Mm -hmm. Can't you just suffer the wrong and try to restore the relationship and make it better? So it's not that we're just... It's to anyone, you know. See, it, it's not to anyone before everybody. It's not before anyone. You see, no, it's before the church family. It's before individual brothers and sisters of the Lord, of the same womb, whom, whom the love of the Lord is operating in our lives. When I confess my fault to a brother or sister, you see, it, it, you know, it, 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 you know I, I trust them. I care for them. They care for me. Quickly, if you would, turn to 1 Corinthians 11. As we talk about confessing faults. See, the Lord is gracious to us. 1 Corinthians 11. The Lord says, if we confess our faults, if we confess our sins, then, you know, He says, if you handle them, you take care of them, then uh, that is sufficient. And I won't, in a sense, have to step in in judgment. Look at 1 Corinthians 11, verse 30 through 32. We read this during our Lord's table time, Lord's Supper. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Remember what I said? James says, are there any sick among you? Is this not just physical sickness? You know, th these ones, uh, because they did not discern the Lord's body, what does that mean? They were in a local, local church and they weren't functioning. Their relationships were all what? At odds. They weren't, you know, you know for, for a, a master not to treat their slaves right. Well, you're a Christian first. You should treat, you know, who cares about public opinion? But they weren't doing that at, at Corinth there. And so he says, for this cause... Okay, back to verse 29. They were discerning the Lord's body. Why did God save you? He put you in a body to, to function, to be a functioning part, a member particular. For one, another. you can't live without each other. Like a cell or an organ, you know. Cut it out of the body, it dies. But God put it there for it to function. And these ones were not functioning. They weren't uh, 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 restoring, repairing. Uh, maintaining relationships as they should. And so they, they said that there are some that are weak, they're sickly among you, and some sleep. That means they, God took them out. God took them out. God said, okay, Tom, you're not going to preach anymore. I'm going to take you home. Why would he do that? Because God is concerned about his name, his honor, his glory. You see, he's concerned more about his honor and glory than we are. If I dishonor him, he's going to do it, take care of it. But look at verse 31. For if he should judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Now it's interesting, there's two words there in, in the Greek. They got the same root word, but they, they mean differently. Okay, the first one means this. Judge means to separate thoroughly. Uh, for if we would judge ourselves, if we would separate thoroughly, okay, from the sin, rightly divide the word of truth, if we would Declare the clean from the unclean, the sin, and say, this is sin, and this is not sin. And then, this word, there is a turning from and a turning to. I'm going to turn from this sin. 
and I'm going to turn to holiness and godliness and Christ-likeness. Okay? And it's like I determined this is sin, my lifestyle, my practice, my words, this relationship is wrong, I have to restore it, and I'm going to do something about it. He says, for if you would judge ourselves, and then we would not be judged. And the word, the second word there, means to be distinguished. It means to be exposed. Come to the light. Could you imagine? I mean, just think of it. Joshua goes through all the list. And finally, it comes to Achan. And Achan comes forward and he says, Give God the glory. Give him praise. I, I, I don't think you can do that. But he said, I sinned. I'm the one who sinned. I'm the one who sinned. You see, dear ones, there's a principle in the scriptures, and it's so, and it's a fearful thing. It's, it's really fearful. The Lord Jesus says this in Luke 8 17. For nothing is secret that shall not be made manifest, neither anything hid that shall not be known and come abroad. There's a, there's, there's a, uh, just a, a holy fear in my heart, okay? You see, God, my Father, is going to expose my sin if I don't take care of it. He gives me a chance to take care of my laundry, my dirty laundry. He says, if you don't take care of your dirty laundry, Tom, I'm going to put it right on the clothes pole. And everybody's going to see it. You see that? It's, just, it's like this. Be sure your sin will find you out. And often, as a pastor, what I have to do, and I'm not saying often many times, but, but the, the principle that I, I work with is this. Lord, you expose it. You bring it out. This brother and sister is doing this. Lord, I have rumors. I hear this, I hear that. Someone says this, and, and oh, you know, and, and, and I have to watch, you know, but I just say, Lord, you expose it. You bring it out. And you know why he's done it so many times? I haven't had to lift my finger. It just suddenly, wow, here's all the facts. Everybody's been honest. Everybody's now dealing with the relationship. People are starting to confess sin. They're, they're confessing one another. They're trying to work it out and bring it back to a proper biblical way. Wow. I don't know. Uh, Pastor Tim says, he's, he says this. He says, he's never seen church discipline work. I have. I've been in churches that actually discipline work. The people were restored back to the church family. And I think they're still in the church family today. But you see, God will expose it. But look at verse 32. But when we are judged, we are chasing of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. You see, we're trophies of grace. We're, we're God's children. We're His family. And God says, I don't want you parading around in the world, okay, and, and not dealing with your sin. You see, it, it, it's, God is so, uh, so uh, anxious. He's concerned for His glory. He's concerned for us as children. He's going to child train us. He loves us. He's faithful. You see, we either deal with the sin, repent of it, seek forgiveness, reconciliation, restoration, and recovery. Or you're going to wish you did. Some of you older Christians, you know what I mean. You're going to wish you did. You know, David sinned. You know, if David would just, you know, confess it in the beginning. You know, I'm not, I'm not trying to try to justify or minimize David's sin of adultery, but you see, uh, you know, a lot of people can fall into that sin, pornography, other things. You know, there's, 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 you know, we're still weak, Lord. We're still frail. You know, and we're, you know, we have to take heed, right? We, we, we don't play with fire. Joseph ran from Potiphar. You know, but see, we do fall. But see, when we do fall, what do we do? We hide. We hide the sin. And God says, no, I'll expose the sin. I'll expose the sin. But see, this is all part of relationships, right? Because God wants us, those schism in the body, He wants us to be working together. We, he wants us to be working on things and working out things and, and repairing the damage and all these things. And so, you know, first thing I, I think it really needs is that we need to, what, uh, humble ourselves 
in love and go to the brother and say, well, you know, I, I have sinned. I have sinned. Please forgive me. Let's start working on recovering this relationship. Let's work together. Let's get on our knees and pray. And, and you know, how easily we are judgmental, right? We'll talk about that, Lord, well a little bit tonight. Let me just close here. Look what it says there in James chapter 5. Verse 13 and 14. It says, is, is there any among you Any among you that you say, well, I'm going to go into the new year and my relationship with my daughter, my son, my husband, my church, is just not right. Well, I exhort you, I plead with you, make it right. You have all the resources. You have God behind you. You do, don't you? You see, I'm not a peacekeeper, I'm a peacemaker. Are you? Peacekeeper just pushes it off, hates confrontation. Confrontation is hard. But see, we have the solution, we have the remedy that they may be healed. And let me just close with that in verse 16. That they may be healed. The word healed means to cure, to make whole, to be free from errors and sins and offenses, to restore, to repair. And I mentioned this earlier. I said, when our relationship with God the Father was <laughs> really on the rocks, right? Worse than that, right? How did the Lord Jesus restore that? Well, Peter says to us, and I want to read it. He says, uh, Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes we are healed. It took, took the very stripes, the very death of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring us into a saving relationship with God the Father. And you know what? It took the same shedding of the blood of the Lord Jesus to bring us into a relationship with each other. Where would we be this morning? What, what has brought us here? It's the Lord Jesus. It's the, the likeness of Lord Jesus in us. Right? I, like, I, love, I love this brother and sister. Not because of all their faults and infirmities and failures and, you know, shortcomings. No, I love this brother because I see Christ in them. I see God working in them. I see God has done a good work and he's beginning that work. And I see, I see some glimpses. I hope they see some glimpses in me that, you know, I'm, I'm Christ-like. I want to be more like Christ. And that's what draws us together. Nothing else, brother. Nothing else will. So the Lord Jesus took upon the stripes. Now, I hate dealing with uh, I hate dealing with this idea of confrontation or uh, this you know relationship being damaged or being repaired. I hate confrontation. It's never easy. It's too hard to mend fences. But see. Paul says this about the Romans, and I believe this about every Christian. Okay? Paul says this, And I myself also am persuaded, Romans 15, 14. Romans 15, 14. I and I myself, meaning Paul the Apostle, also am persuaded of you, he's talking about the Roman Christians, my brethren, that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, Able also to admonish one another. You say, well, what are you talking about, Paul? You know, are you talking about our church? I believe we, we can. I believe we should. We have to. Okay? We, we're full of goodness. You see, if we, we confess our faults one to another, it, it's, not, you know, it's not the inquisition. You know, we, we don't hang anybody. We don't put people to death. It's brethren, family, brothers and sisters in the Lord. Okay? And, and, and uh, it, it, the idea is that um, uh, we're, we're filled with all knowledge. Uh, remember we said uh, last week, we'll, we'll mention this tonight, you see, um, do I want to make a judgment without all the facts? You know, judge not unless you be judged. Do I want to judge... Uh, 
a brother or sister being biased and prejudiced, you would that without the that stone, let him cast a first. He that without the sin, let him cast a first stone. But see, we have to judge. We have to judge. We have to confront. We have to admonish. Because that's only the way the body gets healthy and stays healthy. You see, this year can't be, this new year can't be same old, same old, right? Next year, same as the last. It can't be that way. Turn finally to, you're in James chapter 5, but look at verse 19 and 20. And this is really, this is really the, the climax here. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one converteth him. It means to turn. How hard is it to turn a stubborn brother who thinks he's right? Or a sister who thinks he's right? Who says, you offended me. So maybe we need to crawl in humility and trying to say, yeah, I, I didn't handle it totally. Let's talk. Let's pray. It says, Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one converteth him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death, and shall hide a multitude of sins. Isn't that just like our Lord? You see, he was a savior of souls. We ought to be too. He repaired the breaches, didn't he? Through his stripes, we are reconciled. Through His stripes, we are at peace with God. Through His stripes, we can call Abba Father. And you see, again, uh, may we have just as much concern for the body as we think of for the head. Oh, to be more like Christ. His character and in His work of reconciliation. Who's been given the ministry of reconciliation? Well, 2 Corinthians 5, Paul talks about ministers. Talks about, see, we're in a way that's just pastors, yes, elders, gifted men, but it's also there. There's this for each one of us, because we minister one to another. All of us minister one to another. So this morning, is there any among you that you say, well, my relationship with so and so is not good? Let me ask you, what are you going to do to change it? What are you going to do to change it? He says, confess your faults one to another. Pray for one another that you may what? Be healed. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are so gracious to us that we can confess our faults to you our sins to you. And that you would be faithful and just to forgive us of our sins on the account of the Lord Jesus. Now, Father, we, we, we know it's kind of hard when we have to confess our faults one to another. So, Lord, please uh, humble us all that we would be more receptive, more understanding. Like Paul says, that we are, we are full of goodness. It's your goodness in us. We, we want the best for each other. We want the best for your glory. It says we're, we're filled with knowledge and that we have the scriptures, we know what to do, and that we might be able to admonish one another in love. Father, for this new year, I would want that all our relationships would be uh, God honored in our homes, in our families, husbands and wives, parents and children, each member of the church, deacons and and the pastor, and all of us, Lord, I pray that you would just help us to strive. Where we have failed, please give us grace to rebuild. Where we see relationships weakening, we pray that you would give us strength to uh, do the extra, stand in the gap, to the breach, to pray. And Lord, where we see the relationships that have been severed, Lord, give us tears, give us grace to be a reconciler. We need grace, Father. Thank you that you're not done with us yet. Thank you for the church 
of the living God. Thank you for brothers and sisters in the Lord. We just thank you. We praise you, Lord Jesus, that you took uh, our sins upon yourself. And you bore them away. And on the third day you rose. And now we have hope and peace with our Father. Lord, please help us to act like children. Your children. For your glory, your honor, your praise. In Jesus' name.